Hey Thrive, it's great to see you. Real quick, we want to let you know that there's two ways to experience Thrive with us. The first way is through our online campus, and the second way is through YouTube. If you're with us with the online campus, go and say hi in the chat. If you're with YouTube on your main screen, you can go ahead and pull out your mobile device and join the conversation and join our online campus. If you need some help joining our online campus, what you can do is go to thrivechurchca.com, click our services, and it'll send you the link. It's super easy. You'll love it. It's the best way to experience Thrive Church online. From wherever you are, let's take a moment and invite God into this time, coast to coast. If you're in your living room, on a walk, or even in the coffee shop, this is the perfect time to invite God in to make a move. So go ahead, grab your family, grab your cup of coffee, text a friend to invite them to the church online service, and worship's about to start, so let's do this. Man, it's so good to know that God is faithful. He's faithful yesterday, He's faithful today, and He's faithful forever. Come on, listen this out. I am holding on to faith. Cause I know you make a way. And I don't always understand. And I don't always get to see. I will believe it. Yes, I will believe it. You make mountains blue. You make giants roll. You use songs of praise to shake prison walls. And I will speak to my fear. I will preach to my
is never a time when I don't hear that song that my heart just doesn't soar to heaven along with the praises. I love, I love to praise the name of Jesus. And I hope you really got into that worship as well. I just have a couple of things to share with you. And one of the most important things right now is that we have answered the call to partner with Foster to the Bay. And I don't think there's a more important partnership that maybe we've done in the past five years as a church. This is an organization that is dedicated to finding a loving home for every foster child in the Bay Area. And I want you to check out this video. Today in my city. Today. Today. Today in my city. Today in my city, a child will be removed from their home due to abuse or neglect. Another child will enter the foster care system and another child will be placed on a list of children waiting for a home. I've seen the headlines and studied the statistics. They say the future is grim. They say the future is grim. But we've got good news. But we've got good news. We believe that God redeems the most hopeless situations. That he brings beauty from ashes and turns mourning into dancing. We believe God is near to the brokenhearted, that he brings joy in the midst of grief and gives dreams in place of despair. We believe these children matter to God and that he cares about their futures. We believe that he's ready to write a new chapter in their stories. The Bible says that God sets the lonely in families, so we know that he longs for children in the foster care system to be placed into loving, supportive homes. We believe there's a church for every child. Foster the Bay is a coalition of churches. A coalition of churches is a coalition of churches. Foster the Bay is a coalition of churches committed to providing a loving home for every child in the foster care system. We dream of the day when every church will rise up and answer God's call to care for vulnerable children. We dream of the day when the long list of children waiting for a home will be replaced with even longer lists of families willing to open their hearts. We dream of the day when our cities will be transformed because the church is known as a community where abused and neglected children are cared for as beloved sons and daughters. As beloved sons and daughters. As we move toward that day, we will pray for these children and their families. We will pray for social workers and judges. We will inspire and equip our churches to step forward as foster families and support friends. We will partner with government leaders and county agencies to make this vision a reality. We will press on until there are more than enough families to meet the need. We will always protect, always trust, always hope, and always persevere. We will believe. We will dream. We will love. We are. 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 We are Foster the Bay. So we need 10 Thrive Families to attend the interest meeting. I'm telling you, I am already enrolled. That is coming up on November the 5th at 7 p.m. And it is virtual, so you don't have to worry about going anywhere. You just need to log on to Zoom at 7 p.m. and you'll get the link. I myself am registered and I hope we can get 10 Thrive Families to attend that interest meeting. It's such a, an, an important mission. Uh, that we have partnered with. Um, other things going on at Thrive, we just, I just, I can't not talk about what's going on with the youth. It's such an area of incredible momentum right now. So Sunday evenings at 6 p.m., they meet here at the building. And that is a group that has grown from about, I don't know, I wanna say 12 to now, I think they took like 31 kids to the to the, uh, the corn maze this past Sunday. It's just amazing to see God moving in that ministry, talking about this as a move, right? So, uh, if you have a child that is from sixth grade, and not a child, they would hate to, to hear you say that, but a student from sixth grade to 12th grade, uh, tonight at 6 p.m., the youth will be meeting at the building. And I also just want to shout out to our preschool and our elementary as well. We're actually doing a live teaching here at the building. So if you have kids and you want to be here on Sunday mornings, we have safe, fun spaces on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock for your preschoolers and elementary too. Uh, we have an incredible, incredible series for you. We talk about marriage a lot at Thrive, and I think that's because the world has a lot to say about marriage, uh, but you know at Thrive, you're always going to get the truth. And so we are so excited to kick off our next series, A Better Marriage Story. Go, 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 go! Yes! Oh. Oh. Can't wait to have my boys over for the playoffs this weekend. You know that my mom's gonna be here then, right? What? She's staying with us. This weekend? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, 
as you can see, Steve, she really blindsided him on that one. Yeah, but he's not going to let that stop him. Your mom is great, but I made these plans two weeks ago. Nice recovery. Looks like she's bringing in the defense, Jim. Okay, but I haven't seen my mom in at least six months. Wow, the sympathy card. At this point, it's anybody's game. And you love me, right? Oh, that's dirty. Yes, obviously. I just don't really care for your mom. Whoa, rookie mistake! And he knows it. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I really like your mom. She's great. Great. I really so like her. So she can her. stay. She... This is brutal, man. Come on, no, it's a game. It's my mom. I mean, this happens like once a year. She only comes here once a year. Um, it's a fumble, she's fumble. She's like, football. That's how it goes. Yeah, why are you being such a baby about this? She can watch. This is not gonna end well. We could be here all night, Steve. Thrive. I am so glad to be here with you this morning. So it came across our Netflix feed like a month ago. A new movie came out and they were telling, trying to tell us that it was perfect for us. In fact, it had a 97% uh, rating that it was something that we would love. It was in me and Andy's feed. And I was like, they all say nine. Let's be real, they all say 95, 96, 97%. In fact, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street came through a couple days ago and it said 96. I don't even like scary movies because they scare me. But anyways, this movie came across and it was called The Marriage Story. And the reason I was intrigued right away is the word marriage. Anytime something comes up that is something that we love or that we like to talk about or that helps us out, um, as a family or as a church family, that's something we need to pay attention to. So this movie comes out, a marriage story. The only hang up though, I really wanted to watch it with Andy was it looked kind of like a chick flick. So, but I found the ringer. I found how I could get Andy to watch it. It starred Kyla Ren and the Black Widow or really Adam Driver and Scarlett Johansson. So two excellent actors. I thought this is my end for Andy and sure enough, uh, he came in there, but then we read the description and we were a little bit saddened. It was an all too familiar story about marriage. Didn't go quite the place we thought it might go. But let's look at the trailer together. What I love about Nicole, she is a mother who plays, really plays. What I love about Charlie, he loves being a dad. He loves all the things you're supposed to hate, like waking up at night. She knows when to push me and when to leave me alone. He never lets other people keep him from what he wants to do. Dad, you're too far. I know. It's not easy for her to close a cabinet. He's incredibly neat. She's brave. He's brilliant. She's He's very brave. competitive. So I'll tell Charlie what's happening, and Cassie, you then hand him the envelope. I just get nervous. Can you unserve? What do you mean, like take it back? Charlie and I are getting a divorce, Mom. You can't be friends with him anymore. Gina! Charlie Bird! <laughs> Mom! <laughs> Mom? <laughs> Mom! What? You know, most people in my business, we just transactions to them. I like to think of you as people. Oh, OK, good. <laughs> You remind me of myself on my second marriage. Baby, I'm amazed the way you love me all the time. Part of what we're gonna do together is tell me your story. Did you dye your hair again? No, this is me. You don't like it? Is it shorter? I prefer it longer, but... How are you doing? I realized I didn't ever really come alive for myself. I was just feeding his aliveness. I'll never get to really be his parent again. He needs to know that I fought for him. It's not as simple as not being in love anymore. Eventually, it'll be the two of you having to figure this out. Together. If we start from a place of reasonable and they start from a place of crazy, when we settle, we'll be somewhere between reasonable and crazy. That familiar tale of boy meets girl. They fall in love, life takes its path. <laughs> they don't invest in their relationship though and they fall out of love just as easily as they fell in. And the hurts of the relationship and the distance cause division and divorce is what happens next. 
It was painful at times to watch the selfishness and the wounds drove their decisions, that drove their thinking. Eventually they finalized things though, and a little reprieve comes, like a little break in the movie. But then the clincher at the end, the final scene of the movie. The little boy finds a letter that the mom had written during the early stages of counseling. And it was a letter that a counselor asked her to write, what is it that you love, that you did love, that you fell in love with your husband for? And it was a beautiful letter explaining that he was a really great guy. He was an excellent father, really fun to be with, a great uh, teacher and leader at work, always taking care of everybody. It really made you think, wow. And of course, that's what the director wanted you to think as he panned from the wife to the father and the looks of incredible regret on their faces as their little boy reads this letter. We've heard the story so many times, not just in the movies, but in our own lives, and for us many times in counseling with people. They get on some wrong path that heads towards apathy in their marriage and ultimately, many times, ends up in divorce. And the pain and the heartbreak, the hurts and the wounds that drive decisions, it is many times a typical marriage story. It wasn't ours early on. One that our world though, and the evil one, wants people to believe is the marriage story. Not just married couples, but young people, dating people, just want to live together for a while people. Marriage stories are just supposed to be like that movie. You might even be your story this morning. You might be feeling stuck or spinning your wheels and not going anywhere, wondering, or maybe wondering, should I even do this thing called marriage? So this story that's being told that is just typical that we've just come to expect and just realize it, kind of settle into saying that that's just all it could be. And it makes people start to wonder and think, you know, it, it, what, is there a better marriage story? If that's the way that it normally ends up, is there something that we could look to that's different? Because nobody goes into a relationship thinking that they're going to end up over here, that that's going to be your story. I'm going to find this guy or this girl, we're going to start life together, and we're going to get so frustrated and so upset with one another that we part ways. Nobody wants that story. See, we all long for a better marriage story, and thankfully... You can actually set yourself up to have one. And that's why we're kicking off this series today, to help us tell a better marriage story. And I think the important part of this is that it's really something that speaks to all of us. Because there is a story that's being told, there's something that is in this for people who are married, people who are single or are dating or are engaged, single again, or maybe you're not even at the place where you're thinking about marriage, you're a young person watching, this series matters for you. Because the world is telling us a story every single day. It's a story about wrong beliefs and wrong ideas about marriage. And if we start listening to that story and allowing it to influence and shape how we walk into and approach dating and, and who we're going to marry and then going into marriage, then we're going to end up in the exact wrong place that we don't want to be. See, but to tell a better marriage story, the one that deep down inside, everyone longs for and wishes for and hopes for. See, to get there requires us to choose to think differently about marriage, to walk into it differently and actually ask a much more important question, one that we fail to ask when we get into this season or spot or moment when we begin to think about marriage, and it's this. What does it take to tell a better marriage story? See, to help us answer that question is everything because it sets you off on a different path, on a new path, on a path that helps get you to a better destination than the one that we're being told every single day. And to help us answer this question and to move in this new direction, really we have to go back to the beginning. It's a truly, it's the only good place for us to start. We need to go to the very 
first book of the Bible in Genesis, Genesis, where the marriage story gets introduced to us for the very first time. Genesis chapter 2, Thrive, Are You Ready? Let's open our Bibles together. Woo-hoo! We're going to be in Genesis chapter 2. We're going to read verse 15, and then go down to 18, and then read 21 through 25 together to see this kind of beautiful picture of what God is doing in this moment to help us tell this better marriage story and learn what it takes Starting in verse 15, this is what it said. It says, the Lord God placed man in the garden of Eden. So important to highlight or underline that word Eden because it's a big part of what we're going to understand today. He put man there, what? To tend and watch over it. So man gets placed into this garden. Drop down to verse 18. It says, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. So God had done some creating. There was, Adam was there. The man was there. There were some animals and stuff that were around. uh, And yet there wasn't someone to be with the man. Someone suitable that was kind of his equal and who God wanted. And so there was something missing. God said, that's not good. So he goes on and says, hey, I'm going to make a helper who's just right for him. Moving down to verse 21, it says, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this one is bone for my bone and flesh for my flesh. She will be called woman. And he was like, whoa, man, because she was taken from the man. Verse 24, we see this beautiful picture of marriage and murder. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now, the man And his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. See, this is part of the story when the woman is created. And if you didn't know, actually in Genesis, there's actually two accounts of when God created the world. Yeah, there's two. In Genesis chapter 1, the very beginning of the Bible, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You kind of see this creation account where we see God walking through the different steps and process that he went through over those seven days of creation. But if we move over to chapter 2, we see another account that kind of has a different vantage point, a different intention behind it. It's often known as the garden account or maybe the Eden story. See, this is describing the part of what God did, but also even more, this Eden narrative describes the heart behind why God did it. The Eden story is where marriage was first established by God. Man is created and placed into a garden that is the ideal place to live and to be and to commune with the God that created him. There was no pain, no shame. (laughs) It was a place that God meant for us to live in communion with him. Eden, it's perfect except for man is alone. There's no one like him. I mean, there's lots of animals, an incredible amount of organic food all around him, but no one to compliment him, no suitable partner for him. So God created woman, the perfect compliment to a man and made equally in the image of God. And marriage is described. The two become one and are in the garden of Eden, perfection together. And the passage tells us something else that's powerful. They were naked and not ashamed. Powerful because that's the way it should be. I mean, not worried about the naked part, but just in general, it's just saying the confidence to be who you are, to be God, who God created you to be, to be in communion with God and to just to open up. Yeah, with one another. With one another. Eden was a place where God intended for all of us to live. And I don't mean just physically. I mean spiritually, emotionally. Eden is a metaphor for how life is supposed to be, for how marriage is supposed to be. It's a place where we see that there is nothing between Adam and Eve. There should be nothing between husband and wife. That's where we long to be in our marriages. But does that sound like what so many people experience? Not really. Why? Because we're not in Eden anymore. 
continue reading on to chapter 3 in Genesis, something happens that changes and turns everything upside down. A serpent shows up. The evil one shows up and whispers into Eve's ear, you can have everything. You can be your own God. Here, just he enticed her to eat a piece of fruit and then she turned around and enticed Adam to eat the same piece of fruit. And nothing between man and woman has been the same since. What was next was the breaking of Eden. In that moment, the story of marriage that God was building was broken as sin entered this world. From that moment, the place that marriages long to be, Eden, perfection, connected, intimate, strong, healthy, great relationships and loving is left behind for a much more familiar place to many. Shame, guilt, blaming, hurting each other. Seems like Eden just isn't for us anymore. We've left Eden behind. The marriage story we know is the one from the movie trailer we just watched. Or maybe it's the story that you're going through right now or the one that some people hope to avoid. We're not in Eden anymore. That the place when you get to it can be very disheartening, difficult, painful, whether it's in your marriage or maybe you're just finding yourself there because you feel the separation of the brokenness of sin in your life. And yet, even after that moment happened in Genesis 2 and in Genesis 3, God has some good news for us. See, that's the power of who God is. There's a better marriage story that emerges and comes from those pages of what follows. See, God begins to tell us in the Bible that there is a new story that he is longing to tell with mankind and that is our choice to help us overcome the sin in our life. After that moment happened, God goes, I'm going to do something different. In fact, after that moment where Adam and Eve sin in the Bible, God shows up, it's revealed to him, and he actually cares for them and loves on them in the process. And that's the beginning of God really helping go, you know what? I'm going to help you get to a place where we can see marriages and relations restored. Because ultimately, the intention and design is for how can we figure out a way to get back to Eden again? Get back to a place where our marriages and honestly, all of our relations are healthy and strong. But we can only do that with God in our lives. And we're going to see that ultimately, God takes man on a path where really the answer is Jesus. So you can really only experience the love and connection as a husband and wife through him. Now the whole reason that we started this, this time today and this looking at this story of Eden is this. See, this is the place that our marriages long to be. It also explains how our lives can get off track because of sin. And it's the reason why relationships, honestly, and marriages struggle. But it's also a picture of how God is the only way back to help restore and bring that intimacy and closeness back together again between a husband and a wife. We all long for everyone, man and wife, long to be naked and not ashamed. We long to be that two becoming one. See, it comes down to, though, a choice that we make. A choice about experiencing that beauty of Eden or that kind of typical kind of story that our world is trying to tell us. If you want to get to that place where you have a better marriage story to tell, you have to be willing to say, are you going to fight to get back to Eden? Are you going to fight and do what it takes in order to find yourself with God restored to the place that he longed for and intended to be? Or maybe are you just going to fight to start in Eden? Or are you going to fight to stay in Eden once you experience some of what God intended? See, have you ever really thought about like something that you wanted to just incredibly fight for and something that you would do anything to protect and go after? There's so no lengths that you wouldn't stop to make that happen. You know, back in August when the fires hit uh, here in Vacaville, 
Uh, Sally and I, we've told a little bit about this if you've, if you've watched, but on the day of the fire, Sally and I ended up out in Pleasance Valley, uh, and Sally works for uh, a ranch and has a friend that's out there, and she uh, wanted to, had to go out there because her friend was out of town, and so Sally was there helping just get a bunch of extra horses and things off the property, and so we got our way out there, and we were there, and Sally was dealing with the horses, um, not my thing, and yet there was a neighbor right next door where a large tree had fallen uh, across the road and he was stuck on the other side. He was trying to get out after he was checking out his home. So we had access to a chainsaw and so we went over there and uh, me and a couple of the boys that were with me, Creighton and uh, and Elias, we started cutting the tree down and moving it out of the way. And as we were doing that, some other families started showing up that had homes that were kind of back beyond, behind this ranch where uh, Sally's friend has. And so we started having some conversations, and it was really heartbreaking to see this family had lost their home and everything, and this family had two, and this woman kind of made her way back down and, and ended up talking with me at the ranch because she needed some supplies and was just looking for some help, and I said, hey, just, you know, tell me, did you guys, did your house make, and she's, yeah, it did. Uh, she's like, I'm like, did you guys evacuate? What happened? She's like, I evacuated and left. She was my husband. He stayed there the entire night and fought the fire, and I'm like, immediately intrigued and like, like, what did he do? How did this work? And they'd taken the steps and the measures to make sure that their, you know, some of the, their roof had some of the fire retardant, you know, materials that are a part of it. And they, you know, had the, the, the gap kind of cleared around their home, but they had a tank put in specifically because they were kind of preparing and anticipating that, look, if something's going to happen, we're going to be ready for this. So he stayed literally with a hose throughout that entire night and was fighting back the blaze so it didn't burn down the house that he and his wife had built in that location. I'm like, how did you, like, how did you handle it? Him being at the fire and you being home. She's like, he called me like every couple of hours. And I said, like, how did that? She's like, it was the longest two hours. Every time waiting for that phone call to come, was he going to be okay? He would not leave because he said, I am going to do whatever it takes to protect my family's home. It was incredible. Nothing would stop what he had built. He was willing to fight that hard for something that he loved that much. See, fighting to get to Eden is that same level of tenacity and intentionality that we need to bring to this idea of marriage and relationships. See, when we fight to get to Eden, that's a decision that's actually going to determine something that you need to walk into these next few weeks in our series with. Because if you make that choice to fight, to say, I am going to fight to help us get back to Eden, then God has something that he wants to speak to you over these next few weeks. Whether you're married Whether you're not, God wants to speak to you about who he is. God wants to speak to you about the power of trusting in him and trusting him with the relationship and the marriage story that he longs for you to have, longs for you and your spouse or even your future spouse to experience together. But you have to know what you're walking into and be ready to learn what it takes to fight, to tell that better marriage story and get back to Eden. That's why over the next few weeks, we are actually going to be telling the story of three Thrive couples. They're going to be joining with Sally and I and just kind of go, how can we learn from couples who have had obstacles and challenges to their marriage story, but they've learned what it takes to actually fight and overcome those things. They chose to turn things around from where they were on a path maybe headed for typical, but they said, no, we're going to offer Eden and a better story to tell with our marriage. And they keep fighting to get back for the intended place where God meant for them to be. Now, we want to highlight some of the things that these couples discovered and some of the things, honestly, that we've learned along the way ourselves to help these couples. See, we're going to talk a little bit about their problems, but often if you stay in a place where you're in that typical marriage story place, you get camped out on the problems, and that becomes the only focus on what's going on. But the key to moving forward and telling that better story and finally get back to Eden is this. You've got to move from marriage problems to marriage principles, Move from the marriage problems, and you got to go, okay, how do I approach my marriage with godly principles from his perspective? Because if you can do that, you will change your marriage story incredibly, and you'll find yourself not in a place where Eden seems far away, but how Eden all of a sudden is right there in the midst of what you're experiencing in your relationship together. But you have to have the courage to overcome the hardships and the struggles to refocus your marriage from the problems and go, wait a minute, i got to identify what are some 
godly marriage principles that we can bring into this relationship together. Now, Sally and I want to kind of kick things off this morning with a little bit of our own marriage story, because truly, we're, we're, we're typical in, in, in many ways, especially how we got started. But over time, we realized that we didn't want to be typical, that we wanted to move and fight to get back to Eden. But it only happened when we started following the godly principles that helped us overcome those pesky marriage problems. See, principles, they're going to pull you towards Eden. All those problems are going to push you away. One of the big ones for us was this. Love your spouse first, put yourself second, and you and your marriage wins. I love this. Love your spouse first, put yourself second, and you and your marriage actually wins. Now, I want us to take a look to see kind of where this idea comes from in John 13, 34, and 35. This is the words of Jesus himself, and he says this, so now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. But it's the next part of the verse that changes radically everything. He goes, just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. See, this is Jesus here talking to his closest followers and right before he was about to leave this earth And he's having this conversation with them, and he drops on them this idea of like, hey, guys, I got a new commandment I want to give you. Now, for any Jew hearing that, like a new commandment, they would have immediately been like, what? Like, what what are you talking about? That's like unthinkable. We already have got the Big Ten. You can't really have any more. You can't have like a Big Eleven. That just doesn't really work. A new commandment? What else is there to talk about? And yet Jesus moves on. He says, hey, I want to talk to you guys about loving each other. And that whole idea of loving one another might have been there. But he's like, hey, love each other. I want to make sure you guys get this. Love each other. But it's that part to kind of love in a whole new way. He says, love in a way that like I, Jesus, is like love in a way that I, Jesus, have been loving you. Now imagine, this is right before Jesus would go to his death. To die on the cross to kind of pay that penalty for sin to really make the way for us back to Eden and our souls. And, and then he comes back to life. Can you imagine after all of this takes place, those disciples thinking back on this conversation and going, wait a minute, I'm supposed to love one another. And yet I'm supposed to love like Jesus loved us by willing to sacrifice, put others first, especially in a way Because we didn't really love Jesus in the way that we should have. God's like, hey, I want you to love people that way. Because if you've got that kind of love, the world is going to sit up, they're going to pay attention, and they're going to take notice because that kind of love is so radically different than what most people experience in their lives. Now, if you look at this through a marriage perspective, you have a whole new way to love your spouse and tell a better marriage story. This is the principle of Jesus that you can apply to all of your relationships. Love first is the mentality that we need, the principle that we need to follow. That's what Jesus did and why he told us to love like he did, to follow him. He came to the earth not because we first loved him, not because we made a choice for him first. He came to earth to show us that he would love us first even when we would not love him back. He did, he just loved even when we didn't love him. That's what we need to do to make it back to Eden and our marriages, to just love first, even if you feel like you're not being loved in exchange. Love your spouse first, even if you're second. You actually win and so will your marriage. You've heard us tell our story a couple times in a couple different ways here on stage, and we're not going to stop because... Well, I guess I think of it like this before I ever come on stage, and I'm sure this is true of anybody who wants to represent God's story well. I ask the Holy Spirit if this story, if our story, if other people's story that we're going to try to share could help even one couple or to change the mind of one teenager and what love and what Eden is supposed to be like, then it's worth sharing. Absolutely. 
So our story um, started out very typical. We were so in love. It was so easy to fall in love. And then we had our first fight one weekend. How to fold the towels. I think we've told that a few times, but it was so intense. It was such a big deal, especially for me. <laughs> Poor and <Andy>. for me. <laughs> and then 10 years in, we kind of created a habit. We're still fighting and bickering and blaming and getting mad at each other for the most ridiculous things. And we both realized that we have plenty of fighting power, especially me. Nothing I love more than a good fight, or at least I used to until all things changed. Um, but we were using it against each other yep. instead of rallying our potential at fighting and fighting together to get towards Eden. So how did that start? Like I said, the first 10 years were a pretty twisted version of us trying to be selfish and getting our own ways. But the last 15 years, something happened, and it's because Andy made a change. He decided, and I still know exactly what brought this on, but there came a day where we were just about to get into it, and boy, I was gearing up. I used to get so mad. And he just sat there and said, okay. You know, I don't know what we were fighting about, but I just remember him sitting there going, Didn't matter. <laughs> okay, we'll try it your way. I hear what you're saying. You may be right. Things like that. And I remember stopping going, what, what? You just say, okay. Like, now what am I going to do? Because I was just gearing up for a fight. And it took me a minute. And then the next time it happened, not long after that, it took me a minute again, and I was a little bit disappointed, but intrigued, and then started to hear God speak to me. That's what love is like. Love is like being the person that's willing to fight, to do what's right for you first, for somebody else first. That's what Jesus was trying to show us, what love is like. And so then the story went on. After a while, after months and months of this, I started to act like Andy, and I started to like the fact that we were on the same side, yeah. fighting to get back to a good place, and how good it felt every time we'd go through one of those, those times when we would you know, begin to disagree. Love each other first. And I'm sure sometimes... You got tired of being second. You took that step first often to put yourself second. Um, but I just want to say, and if you know Andy, you're probably not worried about this to begin with, but it's not a rolling over. It's not a meek, um, just do whatever, I don't care. It's not flippant. What it takes to reach out and be second and to love first is really a strong heart and it takes courage. Like, I don't know if this, I'm sure he didn't know if it was going to work the first time. But it's not for the weak-hearted. It's for somebody who's willing to say, I'm going to change things. And I we think that's part of the, the, the story for us is that when you get to this moment, I think there's this fear that we have that, you know what, I'm just going to get walked on. I'm going to get walked over. Uh, I'm never going to get anything anymore. Uh, or I can't ever speak the truth to somebody else. And that's not what we're talking about here because that's not what love looks like. But when love says that I am going to put you first, that means I'm going to listen. It means that I'm going to change how I approach and think about it. That if I have to put myself second for a moment, this matters more than this. Because in the end, if we get this right... And if we do what it takes to make sure that we're loving that person first and vice versa, then guess what? Then this gets strong. Then you'll actually be loved and felt like you're first. And your marriage will ultimately win, and so will you. And that's where this is so powerful and what it takes to do. What does that look like? We've never looked back. Nope. We've never, never once since. wanted to look back. Not at all. We've like, hey... We, wanna, we started getting there, and we like, we're going to stay here and do what it takes. Whatever it takes for us to stay in Eden, that's what it matters to do. And I think the power of that then is like, what does Eden really look like, you know, like for us? You know what I mean? When you think about it, it's like, hey, somebody that has your back, that truly will stand there and be with you shoulder to shoulder and what's going on and be behind you. Like never use the D word. That's one thing that we never did in the process, but there are plenty of times that it was just sort of there, but we never used it. And I would say like, that's never entering the equation, never cutting somebody down or never making fun of somebody. Now, like there's certain things, like Sally does plenty of things you can make fun of, but I'm talking about hey, that. Hey, hey. <laughs> 
She did one just the other day with Amazon. That's another story. Oh my uh, but it's, when I say make fun of, I'm talking about you never like are derogatory and like knocking them down intentionally to be mean spirited. Fun, that's all good and, and all healthy stuff. But you're fighting for each other, not against each other. You're going, hey, how do we stay on the same page together with one another? And one of the things that you've been really good at helping us with is how do we do fun things together on purpose? Because that reminds you of what you love about that person to begin with. And they're working together on the hard things, even the drudgery even taxes. stuff. Even taxes. Even yeah. taxes. I was thinking about this when we were writing. And uh, we wrote the word drudgery. And the first thing that came up in my mind was taxes. <laughs> Absolutely. And taxes, ah, sometimes when Christmas would come around or tax season would come around, we'd both sort of get on this money thing and get a little bit edgy. And we decided Christmas we solved long ago, but tax season... We solved uh, more recently, we now get snacks and drinks, and uh, yeah, when I beer. say drinks, I mean like apple juice. Root beer. Root beer. <laughs> <laughs> and we make kind of a fun evening yeah. about it, because we know we have to do it anyways, but if we join forces and do it on purpose and not complain, it's not so bad. And we do it together, which also then just says, hey, we're equally sharing in something like that. You see, we're loving first putting ourselves second in those moments and going, hey, we want to make sure that we win together in the end because that's the power of what it looks like. But that really requires something of us. To love first really comes down to being unselfish. So you think about, there are areas in our lives, if you think about it, you, you're unselfish with certain things. Like you will do anything for and you will give everything towards. You can think about maybe what your kids, uh, that's just a natural one. Maybe it's a hobby that you love. Maybe it's a pet that you have where you are willing to sacrifice anything and everything for them. And you will put them first because you just, you love it that much and it is so easy to do. And yet, then all of a sudden, we find it so hard to do that for somebody else sometimes. See, and that's just what the serpent was trying to do with Eve back in Genesis. He wanted to get her to think only about herself in terms of, hey, you could become like God. You can be like him. You can be equal. You can do all of these things. He wanted her to just become more and more selfish, which kind of led her to that place where she grabs that fruit and she chose to eat it. See, selfishness is always the root problem that is eating away at good, healthy relationships. We know that. It's just so hard to break that habit, and we end up fighting against the very thing that we long for that takes us to the place that we don't want to be. See, Adam and Eve, they ate that fruit. They ruined Eden. Sadly, too often, we choose to eat that same fruit in our relationships, in our marriages, See, but to break that problem and to really fight to get back to Eden where we can choose to love first the person that is in our lives, you can't be selfish. See, love brings God back in. It brings Eden back close because we're operating and we're loving in a way just like Jesus loved you and loved me. See, if you don't know Jesus... And that idea of the incredible unselfish love that Jesus showed the world by coming and dying for each and every one of our sins and our pain, literally, that's the love that Jesus shows us, and he continues to show that to us today. See, that's another really a metaphor that Eden stands for. Just like it applies to marriage, it applies to the place where he wants to be, create, your creator wants to be connected to you. He, we want to be connected to Jesus in our lives. And the way back to that connection with our creator, the way in our souls to get back to Eden is to trust in Jesus. That's where we find peace. That's where we find joy. That's where we find contentment. That's where God gives us incredible new purpose to move forward in new directions in our lives. Not to the typical, not to the difficult, not to the dead end, painful, or hurtful, but to a place that's connected with him that is unequaled and unparalleled to anything you could experience in your life. Jesus is inviting you back to Eden today. Now, if you're with us and you're watching this, that idea of being connected to God and getting back to Eden may sound so like inviting to you. And that's why Jesus makes this invitation to us. That's why this story and this idea is something that we all in our, in our, in the very fiber of our being, we long for. And today, 
Maybe in your soul, you've never trusted in Jesus. Maybe you've drifted far off the path and started falling into sort of the typical places that the evil one would love for you to live. Jesus is inviting you to come back to Eden today. Jesus is saying, you know what? In this moment, you can put your trust and your hope in a God who loves you so much that he's willing to give up everything for you because you're that worth it. And to walk into this relationship, this idea of Eden that he extends to each and every one of us, you simply need to say, Jesus, I trust you. God, I want to be connected to you. God, forgive me for all that evil, selfish choices and sin that I've committed and done. God, would you forgive me and help me to walk into a new place, this better place connected to you. If that's you today in a moment, I want you to just, in the chat or email us, and just reach out and say, hey, I would love to know more about how can I stay connected to my God and my Savior and make it back to this place that I've invited to by Jesus, this place of Eden. And if you're married and you have that someone in your life or maybe you're dating and, and things aren't where they should be, Eden might seem like it's a far off place at this point. And you're starting to go, wait a minute, we really do focus a lot more on the problems that are going on and that defines us more than figuring out how do we trust the marriage principles of God. This idea that we shared even today about how do you love first, put yourself second, if those things are starting to help you kind of go, wait a minute, I want to get back to Eden. Jesus is inviting you in your marriage, in your dating. Maybe the person that you're thinking about dating to go, hey, you both want to be on a path where you're pursuing Eden together. And Jesus is inviting you to that today. And as we kind of start this series today and begin to walk it through, through over the next few weeks. We, are, God is inviting you and your marriage to make sure that you're here and saying, Jesus, I hear what you're saying and I'm ready to fight. Not against my spouse, not to keep the problems going, but I am going to take your invitation and fight to do whatever it takes to build something beautiful and wonderful and healthy into our relationships that we find our place in this garden that he created and where it's supposed to be in your marriage. Today, you make that commitment to say, God, I'm gonna work my way back to Eden in your soul, in your marriage. This is a great place that he wants to take us over these next few weeks. So would you bow your heads and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in this moment, We've walked through this beautiful picture of trying to understand when you created the world, you made this place where everything was perfect and good and right and true. God, and because of selfishness, it just completely went awry. Marriage went off the rails right with it. We've been desperately trying to get back there personally and relationally with couples ever since. But we've seen today, God, that even isn't some place of the past. It's a place that you invite us to reach for and to strive for and to fight for in our lives every single day because we can attain it, not on our own, but when we partner with God and these incredible truth and principles that he gives to us, God, that is when our relationships, our marriages, our lives get oh so good. And I pray today for the one that says, you know what, I'm not sure that I've been on a path in my personal life to trust Jesus, to be in right relationship with God. I've never experienced that kind of personal Eden before. God, this is a moment of invitation where people can simply say, like I said a moment ago, just a prayer to go, I'm in. I want to trust in Jesus. God, I pray that someone would just be able to just in the chat, just be like, I'm in. I put my trust in him today. God, I know there are couples that are going to be out there going, you know what? This is where we need to be. We've let things go for far too long and we're kind of following into this sort of typical marriage story. But today, God, we are going to fight to get back to Eden and tell a better marriage story. And we're going to pursue and go after it no matter what it takes, God, because that is where we all long to be. And that's where you are inviting us into, God. And ultimately, that's what you modeled for us when you came to this earth. Just the level of sacrifice and commitment it takes if we could just let our spouses know that they're worth it and we love them that much to put them first, God, that is the beginning of a road to see some incredible things take place. I pray today would be, a God, a, a defining moment of new beginnings. To start on a new place, a better place, 
God, to tell a better marriage story. God, I thank you for what you've begun, what your word has conveyed in the truth. May we take hold of it and begin to walk in it. So we give this all to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, as you're watching today, I want to invite you, if you would, to uh, fill out an online connect card. Uh, If you're on our online campus, you'll see our online host post a link right there for it. If you're on YouTube, there'll be another link that you can just click on. And we love to invite everybody to stay connected together as a church. This is one of the things that we love to do is to meet and connect with people. And we know in this kind of distance world right now that this is huge to stay connected with one another, especially in this series, to get back to hear one of the things we're going to hear about in the coming weeks about how that connection to God really happens through the church. Right now, one of the best ways you can start that is to go, how do I fill out this connect card? So if you're a first time person that's been watching or you've been tuning in, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to know that you've watched, that you've engaged. Maybe God is speaking some to your life and you love what God has been doing through watching this message today. Uh, Would you fill out that card? And there's a spot on that only connect card. You can look first time, second time. There's some, uh, that's just helps us to know, to reach out to you and say, hey, thanks for being a part and watching. Uh, There's also some next right steps that we invite people to take uh, because we encourage people at Thrive every week to go. It's not something we just want you to hear about and kind of feel good for a moment. When it gets good is when you act on this and you begin to take those steps daily in your lives. That's what we did in our story. We started living it out and that's when God became so good in this relationship. So would you take a next right step? Maybe you said, you know what? In my personal life, I committed my life to Jesus today for the first time. I wanted to kind of make things right and get back to Eden again. Would you check that down? Or maybe you recommit your life. Maybe you're interested in kind of taking that next step in baptism. But I want everybody, whether you're a first timer today or you've been with Thrive for a long time, there's a moment and a spot in the, that, the, the, the connect card that you can kind of fill out some next steps that you want to take. And I simply want you to put down there today that I am ready to fight to get back to Eden in my marriage, maybe it's in a relationship, maybe it's for you to just go, I need to fight to get connected and stay connected to God. I want you to write that down. Maybe a step that you're gonna to take to go, hey, I'm gonna fight for my spouse, I'm gonna put them first. There's an action that God has placed on your heart today. Would you write that down? Also a spot for prayer requests because we love praying for you and lifting you up in all that's going through in your life. So fill that connect card out if you would. We'd love to hear from everybody and we love getting cards uh, that are turned in. Uh, You can also go to our website during the week if you're watching this and you can click on the link there and that'll help you just kind of send a connect card with us and stay connected with us at any time. Uh, And we also are going to get ready to take up our online offering together. And you see this big smile come across my face because it's absolutely incredible what our church has been doing and through this entire season, even lately, about all that God has done. Uh, You heard us talk talk uh, over the last couple weeks about a family, the Tapero family, and some, uh, their daughter who's going through just a very difficult bout of cancer that's come back, uh, and she's got incredible, incredibly difficult chemo. She's got chemo and radiation happening right now, and it's, it's painful, and it's difficult. And we asked for you guys to send in some gift cards to help with gas and and food because they travel to Roseville like almost daily. And uh, some of you gave some money towards Do Good to help that. As of right now, we were able to go there this week. And I tell you, this is one of the cool things that I get to do as a pastor, honestly. But we got to go over there and we gave them over $1,100 worth of stuff that you guys as a church generously and lovingly said, what can we do? And here's the thing, as we blessed them and the tears started coming across their faces, uh, I got to ask them a little bit more questions here in front of me. There's a lot going on with them. And I just want to challenge you that if you haven't had a chance to give yet, this is a great way to do this, to be able to continue to just say, God, your generosity and what you've done, I want to give to them. Sally and I, we were, went and got a gift card and we were, had that a part of that group that we sent out already. And we can't wait to see what our church is going to do more. So we invite you right now, would you consider giving? Give your regular tithe and giving to thrive. And then would you say, hey, on top of that, I'm going to do some do good stuff right now. Anything you put in there says do good. Or if you put in there Ashley uh, or Tapero, one of those things, all of that do good money, we will make sure we get to them. And your regular giving has just allowed us to continue to operate and do some of the incredible things to let the story of Jesus be known and heard. You know, around here, we love to say it. We want to make it easy for people to find and follow our incredible Savior, Jesus. So thank you for your generosity. 
Thank you for watching today and really being a part of jumpstarting this idea of relationships, specifically marriage, and learning what does it take to tell a better marriage story. Now remember, next Sunday as we go into week two, we have a couple that we cannot wait for you to meet because they have a story that you won't want to miss that it's going to help you to kind of go, hey, how can we continue fighting? How can we continue pursuing getting back to Eden in our relationships? So I want to invite you to come on back next week as we tell the next part, part two of A Better Marriage Story. And would you invite somebody to join you online? Or maybe you want to come in person because we're having in-person services as well. Social distance, wear your mask till you come in. It's an incredible time together. Maybe you could experience Thrive in person for the very first time. We'd love to invite you. We'd love to see you. Thank you for joining us today. And we will see you next time here at Thrive Church.